Dr. Bishan, you are a professor of political science at the University of California, Riverside. Your interests include a range um, from questions of democracy, representation, identity, and ethnicity to public opinion, legislative politics, which we'll be touching upon today, um, Cuban American and LGBT policies. So, you know, following the 2020 election and the inauguration, Democrats currently hold a slight majority in the House of Representatives, losing a few seats this election cycle. And the Senate is split with 50 Republicans and 50 Democrats. Um, I know this can be confusing. There are many rules to Congress. So can you talk about Vice President Harris's role in the legislature these next two years? Sure. Um, and, and Maddie and Laura, thank you so much for having me. Um, so the Senate, as you, as you noted, is split 50-50. Um, and the Vice President of the United States serves as the President of the Senate. And her role will be to vote, to cast a tie-breaking vote in cases where the Senate is evenly split on legislation 50-50. Uh, however, uh, my expectation is that we won't see a ton of votes uh, by um, Vice President Harris, in large part because the Senate has, uh, has the filibuster rule. And so in order for high profile, uh, well, uh, controversial legislation to even get a vote in the U.S. Senate, uh, it currently requires uh, it currently requires 60 senators to vote to end to invoke what's called cloture, which ends debate. Um, and so as a consequence, because there aren't 60 Democrats, there are only 50, um, any bill that is subject to filibuster would need 10 Republicans to cross the aisle uh, and support that legislation. And so as a consequence, if there are 60, of course, if there are 60 Democrats to vote for something, it will pass easily and her vote won't be needed. Right? And so the extent to which she will play an important role on in voting on legislation will really depend on the extent to which uh, Republicans filibuster. They've shown in recent Congresses that when they're in the minority, they've done so extensively. That was their primary tool to try and slow down uh, uh, the Obama administration's attempt to pass legislation. And we saw record numbers of filibusters then. Um, Democrats are really uh, itching to reduce or remove the filibuster, but there are moderate Democrats who, um, who do not want to see it go away. And the reason for that in, is uh, because the filibuster actually protects moderate members of Congress from having to vote on controversial legislation. And so as a consequence, uh, you see members like the Senator from West Virginia who, who represents Joe Manchin, who represents a very uh, Republican state, um, saying that he supports keeping the filibuster, even though doing so means that there are a number of issues that Democrats are unlikely to be able to get to the floor. There are some options for reforming the filibuster that might meet his and some other moderate Democrats, including uh, California Senator Dianne Feinstein's uh, objections to removing it um, and allow and thereby allow Democrats uh, to pass legislation. Um, and I'm happy to talk about those more if you, you know, if, if you're interested. But my expectation is getting back to your original question that um, we maybe won't see quite as large a role for Vice President Harris as, you know, we kind of might expect were there just a simple majority vote on every issue that came before the Senate. Wow, I did not know Senator Feinstein um, opposed getting rid of the filibuster. Um, sure, she's one of a handful of, uh, of senators, yeah. Interesting. Would you mind going over maybe what you think might be the most realistic route? It may not happen now, but maybe in the future of getting rid of the filibuster, would would they have to vote on getting rid of it? That's right. Um, essentially, the interesting thing about the filibuster is that it only requires a majority to vote to get rid of the filibuster. Um, however, uh, the challenge is that the Democrats uh, only have 51 votes. And so even having a single member uh, oppose uh, eliminating it uh, makes it impossible to get rid of. And so, um, so it's a real challenge. Um, there are a couple ways to reform it that might be appealing to some of these moderate members. Uh, right now, the onus to overcome a filibuster 
resides on the resides with the majority party. The majority party needs to find 60 members to go to the floor. And the minority who is holding up uh, who is holding up the passage of legislation actually doesn't need to do much. They just say they're filibustering and under the current way that the Senate operates, um, the majority then needs to shut off debate. Well, an alternative method that's been proposed is to put the onus on the minority and say, okay, if you want to uh, hold up legislation that a majority prefers, then you actually need to be present and have your 40 members uh, present to vote uh, at any moment's notice to maintain the filibuster. So you could still have the filibuster, um, but you would change where the pressure lies to get rid of it. And that would make it so that, um, so that Republicans who wanted to filibuster legislation would make sure they would have to have 40 members always at the ready to vote anytime the majority called for a vote um, on getting rid of the filibuster. And I think that would be, you know, as a first step, uh, that would be a really nice improvement because then what we would see is instead of widespread obstructionism, the minority party would only be able to maintain those 40 votes on issues that were really important to them, mm -hmm. right? And that kind of makes a lot more sense from the perspective of democratic theory, right? We don't want uh, small minorities to be totally overrun by the popular will on issues that are very important to them. Um, and so that might provide might provide for some balance. And of course, uh, you know, the other way that the filibuster can be overcome is there is a process called reconciliation. Um, and uh, reconciliation is simply a process that um, allows for a majority vote on bills that relate to the budget, to revenue, or to spending. Uh, and there can be one, there can be a reconciliation bill on one there could be reconciliation on one of each types of those bills uh, each year. Uh, and so as a consequence, the reconciliation bill simply requires a majority vote and it, it cannot by, by rules of Congress be filibustered. And so what we, see, what we will see is that one way to get around the filibuster on issues pertaining to spending will be to put those issues into a reconciliation bill. Um, and there are some limits on what you can do. It can't touch social security. Um, it can't create a deficit uh, beyond 10 years into the future, um, things like that. Uh, but, um, and, and, it, and it, they have to be bills that relate to either the budget spending or revenue. Um, and so I, I expect that we will see, uh, we will see bills, we will see issues like COVID relief, which is the president's number one priority right now, uh, put into reconciliation in order to in order to have it pass and avoid being filibustered. Um, you may see some other bills that that happens to as well. Uh, you know, things like, for instance, there's a um, one of the one of the bills that passed during the Trump administration was an attempt to punish Democratic states that had um, tax deductions for state and local taxes. Right. A lot of Republicans actually didn't like this. This is one of the things that cost um, some Republican members uh, from California their seats, in particular the seat that Katie Porter ended up winning, uh, because it raised taxes on people in blue states. Um, and so that's a bill that would that would allow you to deduct from your income taxes how much the amounts you paid in uh, state income tax and also your property taxes. Um, and obviously real estate prices in California are very high. We tend to pay a lot in interest and that's an amount that could be deducted. And for many people that led to increased taxes under the Trump administration, they were really trying to punish states that were more progressive in their tax structure. Well, so that's the type of bill that would be very easy to put into a, a budget reconciliation bill, a, an item there. Um, we might also see attempts to improve uh, healthcare uh, to build on the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare. Um, and in fact, Obamacare was initially passed through a reconciliation bill. So, mm -hmm. so reconciliation is the other way around it. But there are many other priorities, really important issues that will be very difficult to put, to, to do through the reconciliation process. And that's where Democrats have to kind of figure out um, where to go. Circling back to your original question, so how can they deal with this? The other possibility is that these moderate legislators uh, come to realize that Republicans are not acting in good faith on these bills and are just being obstructionists. And if they do, they may change their position. 
And so there are a number of senators like Feinstein, they tend to be the very old senators um, who, you know, remember back to the days when the Senate was a little less polarized and they believe in the history of the institution and preserving the institution. Um, and those are the ones who often like Dianne Feinstein, uh, who, you know, support maintaining the filibuster because it's this long tradition in the Senate, even though, of course, the filibuster does not appear in the Constitution. Very interesting. Thanks so much, Laura. Yeah, um, thank you so much for, for providing that insightful information. I didn't, um, I didn't realize how complex filibusters were. Um, and so my question to you is, so the last time the Senate was split it evenly between the parties was in 2001. Um, can you speak to the argument between Chuck Schumer and Mitch McConnell and how they decided to organize the Senate chamber? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, this is kind of an interesting question. Typically, the importance of how the Senate chamber is organized uh, and the agreement that they reach, uh, typically what happens is that on most committees, committee seats are divided up in proportion to the number of seats each party holds. So if Republicans hold, say, 60% of the seats in the Senate, they get 60% of the positions on committees. Um, What's, what, what becomes tricky with respect to an evenly split Senate is that there's actually technically not a majority within the Senate um, for purposes of operating. So they have to come to an agreement. Now, these agreements, um, one of the things you need to understand about the Senate, it's different from the House. The Senate is considered a continuing body. And what that means is that the Senate um, often relies on agreements rather than changes in rules to operate. Unlike the House, which passes new rules every two years, the Senate, uh, technically speaking, has been operating under the same rules for about 240 years. Uh, now, they change the agreements on these rules, and there are parts that change at the margin. But in general, there's an emphasis on comedy, on getting, getting along and coming together, and on building consensus in the Senate. And so it's very easy to obstruct the passage of legislation or changes to how the Senate works. And so uh, because this operating agreement was needed in order to shift the composition of the committee so that Democrats had an equal number and therefore with, uh, with Vice President Harris's vote could uh, vote to select who the committee chairs would be, um, it became important for, it becomes important for the uh, Senate majority leader and the minority leader to come to an agreement on how the Senate will operate, how those committee seats will be divided and what the operating procedures will be. Well, Mitch McConnell attempted to get a guarantee from uh, Senator Chuck Schumer uh, that Democrats would not eliminate the filibuster um, as part of an agreement to uh, over how the Senate would operate. And Schumer just refused to do it. And ultimately, McConnell uh, kind of capitulated. Um, however, uh, it's important to keep in mind that, um, so, so Schumer did not agree that the Democrats would not get rid of the filibuster. However, through that delay, one of the things that um, Mitch McConnell was able to do was they were able to get a number of Democratic senators on the record saying that they, they did not support doing away with the filibuster. And by doing that, it will make it more difficult for those members to switch their position in the future if they want to. So Joe Manchin was one of them who was on record. Dianne Feinstein was another one, right? Now Feinstein, it, maybe it doesn't matter, you know, um, perhaps she won't run for reelection. If she does, she's, a, she's pretty safe um, unless there's a democratic challenge, um, you know, who goes after her for her, you know, lack of doing much in the last 30 years. Um, well, 20 years. And, um, you know, well, I mean, she literally ran on achievements from the early 90s in her most recent Senate campaign, and yet no one seemed to care. Um, and so, you know, so, so for some of these moderate members, this does make it more difficult for them to change positions, even though um, on paper, uh, you know, on paper, it appears that Democrats, you know, didn't give in. And so, you know, it was a victory. I don't know that it was, you know, I don't know that it made much of a difference. I think Schumer had the upper hand here. So um, we'll, we'll see. Thank I guess it's the short answer. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, and then I have a follow-up question. Um, 
So in, in your opinion, what is the most important um, issue currently facing the United States Congress? Yeah, I think there are two issues. Um, you know, I think the I think the single most important issue facing Congress and facing, frankly, um, the country is election reform. We are seeing a widespread attempt now following the November election to disenfranchise Americans and to make it much harder for uh, Americans to vote. Um, currently, there are 28 states uh, that have seen legislatures introduce bills uh, that are attempting to restrict the ability of people to vote by rolling back vote by mail um, uh, and to um, to make voting more difficult by requiring onerous ID requirements, uh, all in response to uh, uh, the, the the narrow victory that Democrats had in a number of in a number of uh, swing states. Um, perhaps most striking is Georgia, which is now uh, trying to pass a law saying that you need to submit copies of your voter identification twice in order to, uh, to vote by mail. There are other attempts that are attempting to restrict the ability to vote by mail by saying you need to have some uh, reason to do so. And um, this is a, a, just a huge problem because, of course, um, restricting the franchise, of course, reduces the legitimacy of elections. And the basis for the implementation of voter ID laws or um, or, or uh, rolling back the ability to vote by mail um, is 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 really primarily a a narrow attempt to uh, change election outcomes by the Republican Party. Uh, the Republican Party is now a minority party. If you go back and look, they have not won a popular vote for president since 2004. So, of the last five presidential elections, they've lost the popular vote. Uh, in all but one of them, and that one was very close. Even the 2004 bush Kerry race was very close. Most recently, Joe Biden won by 7 million votes. Um, uh, Hillary Clinton won by about 3 million votes, right, the popular vote. Uh, if you look at the votes cast for the House of Representatives and for Senate, um, Democrats uh, in the aggregate uh, receive far more votes than Republicans do. Um, but due to the uh, mis malapportionment of the U.S. Senate and, um, and gerrymandering in the U.S. House, Republicans are able to, in the case of the Senate, typically maintain control. Um, in the House, uh, they're able to have far more members than they otherwise would if we had some kind of natural distribution of votes. Um, and this is all an attempt to, um, you know, in order to allow the Republican Party to be more competitive in elections and win elections, um, and along with some other, you know, along with some other uh, uh, policy moves that are going on, we're starting to see the Republican Party really undermine uh, the vote process, particularly in presidential elections, uh, you know, where we've seen moves in places like Arizona and Michigan to take away the power of voters to select um, members of the Electoral College uh, or to certify election results. Um, and, you know, and this is perhaps not too surprising, given that we now know that uh, what we saw on, on January 6th was an attempted coup by, by the Trump administration. They coordinated this attack on Congress in order to stop the certification of the Electoral College vote. Um, and so addressing this issue, um, addressing this issue is, I think, the single most important question facing democracy today and facing the country today. And how will they do that? So the Democrats have have uh, proposed legislation um, that is directly going to strengthen voter rights. It will um, uh, prohibit vote purging, which is another strategy that's being used where um, in a number of these states, in the, of the 28 states that we see, there have been 100 and, what, 108 bills introduced to roll back people's ability to vote, to limit people's ability to vote just in 2021, just in the last four weeks. Yeah, it's, it's really striking. Um, and so one of the things that, that Democrats have proposed in this bill is prohibitions on voter roll purging. Um, they, they have uh, proposals to make online voting compulsory, automatic, so that you don't even have to register to vote. You just simply are uh, registered to vote uh, automatically. Um, and then the other issue is um, it 
it creates and requires states to implement independent redistricting commissions, both for Congress, both for the US Congress and for uh, their state legislatures. And this is really important because in many states we've seen, uh, we've seen an attempt by Republicans to uh, weaken other branches of government when they control the legislature if they're not able to win those races. So for example, in North Carolina, um, just a couple of years ago, we saw once Democrats won the governorship, the Republican legislature, while the previous Republican governor was a lame duck, passed a slew of legislation designed to weaken the power of the governor to act unilaterally and to strengthen the power of the legislature, which they controlled because they controlled gerrymandering. They'd set up districts to disproportionately represent the Republican Party. We see the same exact thing in Wisconsin, um, where they're, they're seeking to roll back. And right now, we're seeing in Pennsylvania, uh, just two years ago, automatic, no questions asked, voter registration was passed. And um, it, but they're their legislature is controlled by Republicans, and Republicans are now seeking to undo all of that legislation. Um, and um, and you know, so so these independent redistricting commissions would play a really big role in making sure that state legislatures are reflective of the citizenry, uh, and that the national legislature, the U.S. Congress, is also uh, reflective of the citizenry. That that HR one that can, that election reform bill. Um, would also mandate the release of tax returns for the president and vice president for 10 years uh, prior to the election. So you might imagine why that, that was included. And then the other thing it's going to do is it's going to force uh, campaign donors uh, by reforming campaign finance laws to become public. Uh, so that you can't make secret contributions under shell company names and things like that. You will know who is contributing to which campaigns. So those are those are kind of the key aspects of HR one, and really essential for preventing um, you know Republicans. I think of the 28 states that have introduced this kind of legislation, 18 have unified Republican control, which means it will pass. All of these bills will pass in those states in some form, um, and so that's you know that's a real that's a real challenge. Wow. Um, and wow. <laughs> I, you know, I know in this past week, week and a half, um, President Biden has signed so many executive orders and has made um, at least type, kind of a marketing communications point that he's touching upon all these crises. Um, but especially, I mean, one thing that's one thing domestically, but internationally, and just, you know, he only has so much power, we need legislation to be passed. Um, and as you mentioned before, you know, um, for President Obama, they just wouldn't send anything to the floor. They wouldn't vote on anything. Um, do you see that kind of standoff happening immediately um, or waiting till 2022 to see what happens, you know, again in the House and the Senate? Yeah. So, um, no, I don't think they're going to wait. I think Democrats are going to push a broad based agenda and they're not going to be as patient as President Obama was. Perhaps the biggest mistake that the Obama administration made was attempting to do things in a bipartisan manner. Um, and the reason for that was that Republicans were not acting in good faith. They were actually very clear that their goal was to kind of run out the clock as much as possible. And they did that the first two years. And then in 2010, they suffered a, a massive defeat. Um, that was just widespread. I think Republicans picked up, they ended up with like 258 House seats. Um, and so then Obama was not able to pass much of anything as remaining, um, you know, the, the next two years. Um, and while he was able to be reelected, he faced this uphill climb constantly throughout the rest of his, um, his second term. Um, and I think Democrats are kind of on to that to some degree now. Uh, Joe Biden is an old school Democrat who, um, you know, I think he believes in bipartisanship, but he's also, I think not, you know, I think he's less likely to get played to some extent, um, you know, by uh, false offers. And so, you know, we're seeing it right now with the COVID relief plan where Biden has said, look, I really want to get bipartisan support for this legislation, um, but if they don't want to support it, we'll pass it through reconciliation. And that gives him a lot more power than, um, you know, than was commonly appreciated because, uh, he doesn't have to worry on that issue about the filibuster. The challenge is, though, he doesn't want to go alone because he wants to build support across these issues for other important issues. 
whether it be things like HR1, which is not, you know, this, this election reform bill, um, you know, that's not something you can easily put into a reconciliation because it doesn't speak directly necessarily to, um, as a budget revenue or spending bill, although maybe pieces of it you could. Um, and, um, you know, things like immigration are not, it's, you know, I, that's not going to be the filibuster. And Republicans have largely shown themselves to either switch positions, those who are supportive of immigration reform, like Marco Rubio. He was one of the leaders of the Gang of Eight, you know, just, you know, 10 years ago. Um, and now he opposes a pathway to citizenship, for instance. Uh, Lindsey Graham was another one of those members, the Gang, gang of Eight members. Um, John McCain was on that committee as a Republican, and so was Jeff Flake. They're obviously, you know, McCain has passed away, but uh, Flake is no longer in the Senate. So it's really hard to see how legislation like that will, will, will be passed. And so um, I think Democrats know that, uh, you know, yes, they'd like to find a bipartisan way to move forward, but, you know, they face this challenge where Republicans are, you know, they are the party that protects the status quo because the status quo protects their interests, right? They, protects the, they protect the people with power um, and, uh, and, and with wealth, frankly. And, you know, and so the, the country is currently structured in a way that benefits those people. And so their preference on most issues is not to change anything. And, you know, the United States government is, uh, is designed to make it difficult to change things. And um, when you add features like the filibuster, it makes it even more difficult to pass legislation. And so, you know, so the Democrats are faced with the, with the challenge of figuring out how to address that while addressing, you know, this wide range of issues that are really important, whether it be um, the Equality Act for, um, you know, reducing discrimination against LGBTQ Americans, uh, immigration reform. Um, and the challenge is, you know, you mentioned the executive orders. The real challenge here is that um, president Biden can issue a lot of executive orders, but the challenge with the executive orders is the next president can come in and undo them, right? And so legislation is really important because it makes it more permanent. It is much more difficult to change and it makes it longer lasting. Um, so those are, and, and you know, the other issues are things like, you know, um, DC statehood. You know, we have, we have Americans who are not represented in, um, you know, in Congress uh, with voting members anyway, uh, Puerto Rico statehood, right? And those are things the Republican Party is going to oppose because they're worried that, of course, uh, you know, the senators that would come along would vote against their party's interests. And so, you know, these are some of the challenge firearms background checks. I mean, there's a whole list of things that they're, you know, I think interested in that the Republican Party is going to oppose. Um, and it's not clear that they can get through under the current rules. So those are the real challenges that, that, uh, that President Biden faces. Yes, and I know uh, President Biden has been trying to stay out of this um, impeachment trial, but you know, there's back and forth of well, it could postpone his agenda, and you know that there's some politics behind it for sure. So um, you know, Senator Rand Paul recently motioned to dismiss the second impeachment trial of former President. Donald Trump with 45 Republicans voting in agreement, um, five siding with Democrats. In your opinion, what does this mean for the Senate as well as pre uh, President Biden's agenda? Does it, is everything on hold right now? Will this trial go through? How quickly? Yeah, well, so the trial is going to occur, but what it indicates is that you've got 45 members of the Republican Party who are looking for a reason not to convict Donald Trump. And, you know, clearly the answer for many of them, some of them are true believers, um, but the answer for many of them is that they fear that they need Trump's voters. Um, and so uh, the reason they've given, we call this motivated reasoning, they're looking for a reason to get to the decision they wanted. They're not, you know, using a principal decision because normally when we think about um, the constitutionality of legislation, that's a question for the Supreme Court. Right. This is not something that Congress decides. Um, and there is precedent in Congress for impeaching people after they've left office. It goes back, you know, like 100 years. So, um, you know, this is not real, you know, high level, um, you know, principled uh, voting here. This is a this is a way to try and get the charges uh, dismissed. And what it indicates is that Republicans are very unlikely to vote to convict him irrespective of the evidence. It doesn't matter how strong the evidence is going to be. They're looking for a reason not to, uh, 
you know, not to uh, uh, convict him. And what that means is, you know, you have 45 Republicans, uh, 17 Republicans need to vote to convict him in order for him to be convicted. Um, and that's extremely unlikely to happen. That's really what that vote indicates. And this was just a pretext for expressing that expressing that displeasure and trying to pressure the five Republicans who are voting uh, to allow the, the trial to occur, um, uh, you know, to, con to continue on, uh, to, 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 to pressure them to send them a message saying, hey, you better be careful because there's gonna be a lot of blowback if you, um, you know, if you vote to convict. Wow, well, Dr. Bishan, thank you so much. I learned so much. <laughs> and this has just been a wonderful talk, I think there. Uh, it seems like everything's a priority these days, um, but HR1, I'm really excited to see what can happen. And, you know, with something like that, we could see in, you know, the midterm elections as, as quickly as that, um, it's effects if it, if it gets approved. So I just want to thank you so much for joining us, taking the time out of your day. And this, um, I think Congress can be a little bit intimidating to the average American, the rules and the this and the that, how are the chamber's different and all that. Um, so I, I hope, and I'm sure this did uh, clarify some questions and kind of help set the stage for what to expect uh, soon from this new administration. So just thank you so much for joining us. This was really wonderful. Uh, you're welcome. I, you know, can I add one thing? Yes, please. Okay, so, you know, one thing to keep in mind here, the challenge that Democrats face is but the 2022 elections, what we call midterm election. And in midterm elections, the party of the incumbent president typically loses seats in the House of Representatives and in the Senate. Uh, and the reason for that is often because uh, the party that wins the presidency is um, one that is the, the popularity of the president in mobilizing voter turnout brings a lot of voters who are not regular voters to the polls. And so the consequence is that a lot in real in, in what we call marginal districts and in, in districts where the race is kind of tight, uh, those extra voters that a pre popular presidential candidate will bring to the polls are enough to, to kind of push over the line um, a lot of co-partisans. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the reason that we think that um, that parties lose so many seats in midterm elections is because the president is not on the ballot. And so a lot of those kind of infrequent voters don't show up. And without those votes, they don't have enough, they don't hold enough, um, they don't have enough support to get elected. And a really good example of this is 2018. We saw 2018 turned out to be a wave election for Democrats. And part of the reason Republicans didn't do well was Donald Trump was not on the ballot. He wasn't mobilizing people to show up. We saw that again in Georgia. Uh, in the Senate races just now in the special election, Donald Trump was not on the ballot. Both Democrats won in Georgia, despite the Republican Senate candidates in Georgia in just this last November when Trump was on the ballot, almost getting enough votes to avoid the runoffs. Um, they beat, they had more votes than the Democrats. So just a month later, right, we see a flip in the number of votes. Well, so the interesting thing about 2000, so Democrats are worried that they're gonna lose control of the House of Representatives in 2022 and possibly the Senate although the Senate looks a little better for reasons, you know, for other reasons. There are a lot of Republican seats, Republican members who are up in 2022. The interesting thing though about this upcoming election is if there was ever an election where Democrats, uh, the incumbent party is likely to hold their seats, it's probably 2022. It's hard to say for sure, but the reason is because Joe Biden did not have coattails. And what I mean by that is when you look at, um, all of the marginal races in 2020, in this last November's election, what happened was typically the party of the candidate who wins the presidency gets a big surge in the number of people elected in his party. Well, Biden didn't. If you look at all the really close races, Democrats lost almost every one of those close house races. And so what that means is that the close races actually may have benefited from Trump's turnout, not from Biden's turnout. And so obviously Trump will not be on the ballot either. And so we may see, we may not see a drop off in democratic support. We might see, now the challenge for Democrats of course is that the house right now 
is there are probably 222 districts. It's technically 221 to 211. But there are, ten, there are 222 districts that voted for Democrats. One was appointed to the administration, so he's, he's not serving. Um, and so you've only got about a five seat margin for control and five seats is so close out of the 435 elections that it could go either way. But the election does not look as bad for Democrats, I think, as a lot of people suggest, because Biden didn't have those strong coattails and a lot of marginal Democrats were not elected. In fact, there were a lot of marginal Republicans elected. So we'll have to, we'll have to wait and see, but, but a lot of Biden's ability to push through an agenda will depend on what happens in 2022. Anyway. Wow. Again, I did not know that. And that's, that's exciting news, because I, I have heard, um, I think, speaking with you previously that um, you know, it tends to switch at the midterms, can, you know, jumbles everything up. And for Democrats, that would be huge. That would give them uh, two more years to, you know, continue uh, President Biden's agenda. Yeah. And, and of course, you know, the Senate will be similarly close. Um, there's a lot of what we call exposure. So Republicans are incumbents in 20 of the races, 20 of the 33, 34 races that are up in 2022. And so the more seats you have to defend, the harder it is to hold on to all of them as a general rule. Um, but if more Republicans are turning out because they're angered by what Biden does or something, well then, you know, then it becomes, it's really hard to say. Um, but, you know, the idea that Democrats might pick up a seat or two, that would make a huge difference. If they could get to 52 or 53 senators, then, you know, then they might really be able to do something with the filibuster because you could still allow people like Manchin or Feinstein um, to, you know, to vote the other way, or even a third one, right, and then have Harris break the tie. Um, and, uh, you know, you might be able to, you might be able to make some real movement there. So a lot of uncertainty. Right, yes. But, um, yeah, we'll have to watch out to see what happens. I, I feel like we're always having an election, and it's always campaign season in America. Um, so I feel like, if anything, the stakes are just up right now, or pe at least more people are paying attention, maybe. Um, yeah, for sure. For wonderful. Sure. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. This has been you're great. Very, you're very welcome. It's my pleasure, and uh, good luck with everything.